and welcome everyone to now the seventh exercise of mathematical image processing. This time uh, we are going to recall some of the things we saw last week on the discrete Fourier transform and um, yeah, do some further stuff in order to um, yeah, get a better understanding on how the discrete Fourier transform works because in the end, what you also saw in the lecture, we want to use a frequency analysis in order to, for example, smoothen up our images. Let me start by recalling some of the things that we did last week. So we started out with a signal f in the complex numbers, and um, we also assumed that f is periodically continued. Yeah, but uh, after all, it's just an n element vector, and that's good because those are the kind of objects that we can represent on our computer. We then defined the discrete Fourier transform for signals of length n via this sum here over um, the components of our signal from k equals to 1 to n, and we multiplied them with uh, yeah, a discretized periodic function. Yeah, so these frequencies omega j minus 1, they are precisely defined by 2 pi over n times j minus 1. So now the idea of Fourier transform or the discrete Fourier transform is basically an idea that you know already from linear algebra. It's about writing a vector, in our case, a vector from a complex n-dimensional vector space as a linear combination of suitable basis vectors. And in our case, these basis vectors come from periodic functions, but in a discrete sense. And these periodic functions are um, discretized versions of, well, the usual trigonometric functions, our trigonometric functions that we use here. And how does this linear combination work? Last week, we spent a lot of time getting to understand how this discrete inverse Fourier transform comes into play here. In the end, we saw something like, okay, so the discretized functions that we have here, they, as considered vectors, of length n, so if j runs from 1 to n, they give me a vector in an n-dimensional space. And if I calculate the Fourier coefficients corresponding to these uh, basis elements, I then can write my original signal again as a sum over Fourier coefficients times a prefactor and also multiplied with my periodic functions at the precise time step fj. So discretizing our periodic function means going to the discrete frequencies that we also have up here. Yeah, this also corresponds to discrete period lengths t. And in the end, what, you, what we saw was uh, the following, which is, I think, very good visible from the formula for the omega j. If j gets bigger, then the frequency gets higher huh? or the period gets shorter. The example that we con uh, consider was a four-dimensional example. So you recall this sketch here where I took a look at the real part of, so let me briefly go back to our exponential with complex argument. The real part is a cosine function. Looking at this real part for all available frequencies in our vector space gave us four curves. So in particular, we got uh, the constant curve, which I get for plugging in j equals to one. And this is just a constant one function. 
for j equals 2, I get my first frequency, which is, well, a, a cosine that precisely runs along one period. For j equals 3, I get the cosine that has two period lengths 2. And for j equals 4, I get one with period length 3. What, what we can see here, or what we observed here last week, was that it seems that if we just look at the real part, we cannot distinguish the green curve from the blue curve. Yeah, because at the computer, we only know our signal or also our vectors at the discrete point in time. This means I can only look at some imaginary lines that I'm going to draw here. I only observe my signal at these vertical lines. Yeah? And if I, if I cannot look a little bit to the right and a little bit to the left, I'm not able to distinguish the blue signal from the uh, green signal. And the computer cannot do as well. But we were looking for a basis. And then we, we remembered that all we are looking at here is a real part and that our signals differ in the imaginary part. So here I draw, drew only the imaginary parts of the blue and the green signal. And we saw, OK, at time step two, and at time step four, we have a slight difference. So um, from the point of linear algebra, we are saved because the basis functions that we defined here, which are precisely the discretized complex uh, exponential functions, they really form a basis. Yeah, there, there are no two vectors that are the same. But still, if we look at, at the first image, um, our intuition is a little bit hurt because, as it seems, we are not able to distinguish a high-frequency component from a low-frequency component. Yeah, so what does the Fourier transform worth if I cannot say if I have a, a signal with a strength or with a period of um, or with a frequency 2 pi over 4? I cannot, or um, yeah if I have a signal with frequency 2 pi over 4, and I cannot distinguish it from a signal with a higher frequency, 3 pi over 2. So let me plot the continuous versions uh, once again here in octave. So I consider now the continuous signal on the interval from 1 to 4. Um, ah. So I'm on the interval from 1 to 4, just like we have indices going from 1 to 4. And now I want to plot the cosine of 2 times pi over 4 times x minus 1. OK, so this is just the cosine over one period. So far, so good. So now let us plot the other signal with, with the frequency 2 pi, uh, sorry, sorry, 3 pi over 2. OK, clearly now from the continuous point of view, we see, oh, this, this curve here is, oscilli is oscillating more than the other one. Yeah, so I have, when so the first one only gets one period done, the other one has, uh, I think if I counted correctly, um, yeah, so more than more than one. So this is one period. Here is the second one. Yeah. So second and two, at least two periods here. So and now we take a look again at uh, the points where both signals coincide, yeah, which are the points one, two, three, and four. And um, I, I plot also those. So, and then I'm, I'm going to mark them with a circle for you so we can uh, see it a little bit better. Okay. 
So, um, not sure if this is visible, so maybe it's better if I just copy this in order to make some annotations for you. So these are the two signals that we just created. And if I look at the discrete points in time, so this is basically the plot that we had before, and those two signals coincide. So let us sum up what, what, we, what we have seen so far. So our basis, our, our basis of the complex vector space C to the N cannot distinguish between the frequencies omega 1, which is pi over 2, and omega 4, which was 3 pi over 2. So um, the first conclusion is that uh, we cannot conclude um, that our signal contains a high frequency part omega 4. At the same time, we could not conclude that it has a low frequency part because, well, it could be the one, it could be the other, or it could be a mix of both. So, and the conclusion, uh, so the final conclusion that one has here, and so maybe you have also heard this in one of your classes on signal processing, is that we have to make an additional assumption. And this additional assumption is that um, the frequencies in our signal lie within the range of detectable frequencies. So I, before even analyzing my signal, I already say, okay, um, there is only a range of frequencies that I can detect. And um, those are the ones that lie between minus pi and pi. And those are called the Nyquist frequency. So summing up is, so the discrete, oh, let me shorten this up. So the DFT, the discrete Fourier transform, can only detect angular frequencies that are smaller than omega Nyquist, which is pi. All right. Let us come back, or let us first observe our, our two frequencies from the example. So omega one was pi over two, which is smaller than pi, all right. Omega four is three pi over two, which is larger than pi. So what we also did last week was to observe that this high frequency, 3 pi over 2, and so if it does not matter for this plot if I consider cosine of 3 pi over 2 or if I consider a negative frequency minus pi halves. This is very, uh, a very nice frequency because it's basically the one that I also have for my blue signal but with a negative sign. So, but why, why should I care whether my, uh, my wave travels to the left or to the right? Yeah, so from this point of view, J equals two and J equals four give me two um, frequency components that have both um, the same right to exist. Yeah? So this one does actually not correspond to a high frequency, but it corresponds to a negative frequency that is just as, as big as the um, one that corresponds to J equals two. So in particular, the absolute value of both frequencies is then when I shift them into the range of detectable frequencies, always smaller or equal than pi. Okay. So how do we now work when we, when we uh, do the frequency analysis here? So we have first step number zero that we, we should do only once. Yeah? So if I, have, if I have a signal F in C to the N, 
Then I have the Fourier transform F, so FFT of small f, yeah, then the octave or MATLAB notation. This will also give me a signal C to the N. And now I need to detect which, so the first thing, and I need to do this only once, is I need to know where in the signal f are the coefficients that precisely correspond to this critical frequency. So omega Nyquist is omega, uh, sorry, omega Nyquist is pi. So in order to detect omega Nyquist, I need to show, see at which position omega j, which is 2 pi j over n, I have this critical frequency pi. So the critical frequency that tells me I cannot detect um, a signal that has a higher frequency. So this is an easy equation. I can just resolve it or rearrange terms in order to see that it's precisely at the index n over 2. Yeah, so the if I am at the frequency omega j for n over 2, I have found my critical frequency. So this is just in order to know which parts of the signal I need to look, look at. So the second thing I need to do is I need to identify so for example, in our example, 3 pi over 2 with 3 pi over 2 minus 2 pi, which is minus pi halves. Yeah, so this is, this is what we do maybe in our head. Yeah, so we say if I'm larger than the Nyquist frequency, I need to shift back by 2 pi in order to get a negative frequency that once again lies within the range and so the negative frequencies are, not, uh, are something that are at the moment not covered by the definition of the Fourier transform or the inverse Fourier transform as we had it. So what we also need to do is we need to extend our Fourier transform periodically. One could say it's just fair to say that if I start out with a signal f that is periodic, also its Fourier transform should be periodic. So let us, con let us take a look at this last step. So my signal f yeah, has components f1, f2, f3, and so on up to the final component Fn. So this is my original signal. So, and if I continue it periodically, this means I also want to have a value F0, F minus one, and F minus two. So we have, we know this already from our circular convolution, what we did there. Also continue it to the right with N plus one, Fn plus 2, and so on. Periodic continuation means the values that I just wrote here in blue are, are not new. So Fn plus 1 is actually F1 again. Fn plus 2 is F2. F0 is the same as Fn. F minus 1 is the same as Fn minus 1. So I'm practically using my original signal and putting copies right to it and left to it. So how about the Fourier transform? So the Fourier transform as well has coefficients f1, f2. And then now I'm going to add also our critical frequency here. So the critical frequency lies at the coefficient n over 2. And just plugging in this index here. So this is my original Fourier transformation. Okay, and what I know is that the good frequencies, so those that I, 
that I can interpret correctly are these first ones here. Those are good. And the other frequencies, so think about uh, this case here, 3 pi over 2. They are too large or too high. These frequencies are too high. And therefore, what I need to do is I need to shift those frequencies by 2 pi to the left. And this corresponds to shifting this portion of the vector here to the left. But the Fourier transform originally was not defined for coefficients here. But once I extend my Fourier transform periodically by saying, OK, I have here f0, here I have f minus 1, f minus 2, and so on, I can now just identify this one here with f0, uh, with, uh, with fn, and so on. So I just take this half of my Fourier transform coefficients and I write them left of the coefficients that are good in the sense that the frequencies that I find there are easy to interpret. Okay, so let us let us focus on this last part here with the Fourier transforms. I'm going to write it down uh, again now with the with the reordered frequencies and Fourier coefficients. So what I get once I reorder like this, so I start here with f minus n halves plus 1. So this is the leftmost coefficient of the too high section, will be the first here. Then I have f minus n halves plus 2. OK, and so on and so on until I reach f minus 1 and f0. Then comes my original part, f1, f2, until the last one that remains at this position, fn halves. And of course, I also um, I, I only did a copy. So the Fourier transform still continues here. So how are the frequencies? Which frequencies correspond to each Fourier coefficient? And this is the important part if you want to do filter design or frequency analysis. Now we really need to um, plug in our intuition that we have for the correspondence between Fourier coefficients and frequencies. So let us start with the ones that we already know. So F1, this one corresponds to omega 1 minus 1 which is omega 0. And note that we have this nasty shift uh, between Fourier coefficient and the corresponding frequency because in the octave or MATLAB setting, we always work with one based indices. So we need, we need to have this shift. So omega 0, if you recall the definition, so let me write it here on the left-hand side. So omega j was nothing else than 2 pi n over j. So if I plug in j equals 0, I have here, um, or maybe it's, I think it's easier if I write it like this. So I have j minus 1 here, and also omega j minus 1 here. And this guy corresponds to fj. So this is the, in, the, in the abstract setting. This is the correspondence that I have. You also see it when you take a look at the formula of the Fourier transform. OK, so omega 0, what is it? Is it? It is zero. This is the constant part in our signal. This interpretation remains the same. Okay. So then I have omega one, uh, which is two pi over n uh, times one. Uh, it's also a good frequency here. And I end with omega n halves um, minus one. Yeah, so this is the last frequency that it is still smaller with its uh, its absolute value is still smaller than uh, the Nyquist frequency. 
Let me maybe also copy our assumption here to the left. So what is now happening on the on the other side? So this guy here, n halves plus one, is the one that I copy now to the leftmost position. So I have here omega minus n halves. So if I now plug in minus n halves uh, there, I just get the Nyquist frequency. So which is just uh, the negative Nyquist frequency. So I'm precisely here at this boundary point. Okay, and then it goes on until I'm here at omega minus one. But I already know now is omega minus one is the one is the frequency that corresponds to omega one. Yeah, the same as so this is how how we constructed it. Omega minus n halves minus one uh, plus one sorry, which is the one corresponding to f minus n halves plus two. This is the one that corresponds to this frequency here, the highest frequency that I can detect. You could say that maybe this last coefficient here is, um, is useless in some sense to us because it does not have a counterpart and that actually the frequency is already a little bit too high for us to detect. So what I now have here, and now you can really use your the intuition that, that already comes with the formula. that low frequencies are the ones that are near to f1 or omega zero so and here i have the low frequencies and outside i have the high frequencies so what i did actually was i centered my information of the Fourier transform so that I, if I point at the middle of my, um, of my vector of Fourier coefficients, I really get the smallest frequency. And if I uh, point at the outskirts of my vector, I really get the high frequencies. So I'm not going to write down this example by hand. I'm just going to copy it. But we saw this example already last week, which was a very simple vector. This is basically the, the table that we had before. So if I if I have my signal f, that is just one zero minus one zero. Also do it here in octave for you. I have the signal here, and I take the Fourier transform of it. I see that the Fourier transform is zero two zero two. All right. So now let us look at uh, at what we have here. So we start out with this information. This is what also MATLAB or Octave will return us. Yeah, I have at the position one of my vector, I have the Fourier coefficient zero. Then comes a two, three, four. So this is the the setting. So now what we discussed was in order to interpret these frequencies here correctly, so those in order to interpret the frequencies that are too high, I need to interpret them at another position of the vector. So I need to actually interpret them as coefficients that are in this part of the periodic continuation. So, but how should MATLAB know uh, what, what should be here for these indices, minus one and zero? In the end, we have a one-based indexing system. So what we need to do is use a, a MATLAB command or Octave command that is called FFT shift. And this command carries out the shift that we just discussed or this, the, well, the intuition that we should get with this shift. Um, well, it is just a program that now solves this. So let us say we have a, a signal of length 10. Yeah, so that means we have coefficients 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 10. Okay, so now the, the critical frequency is around 5. 
Yeah. And now what we would do is we would shift the other half to the left hand side. So, and there's a command for this in MATLAB. It's just FFT shift. I plug in this result and I see, oh, yeah, it just worked. So it did not only the, the shift that we wanted, but it also shifts back into the um, indices or the range of indices that MATLAB can address. Yeah, so once we have one again, once again, a vector of length 10, and now, well, the second half comes for the first half. So now we want to design a filter. Yeah, and because now we really have a position that we can aim at if we want to filter out or maintain certain frequencies. In the lecture, you learned about low pass and high pass filters, or also band pass filters. So the ones that we use for image processing are the same, the same that you may already know from uh, classes on signal processing. And the idea is always to just cancel out a portion of the uh, frequency information and maintain the other one in order to get rid of high frequency or low frequency components here. So what we need to know in order to um, precisely cancel out the frequencies that we are not interested in, we need to know the location of the M lowest frequencies. So M is a natural number. So for example, this two or three lowest frequencies um, and omega zero in our a shifted signal. Yeah, so if I if I shift my signal, or if sorry, if I shift the Fourier coefficients, um, what was obvious from this plot here, yeah, where I said well the low frequencies are the ones that are around uh, F1, and the other ones are well those in the outskirts. Um, I need to map this intuition to uh, the fact that in Octave or MATLAB, I only have indices starting at one. But I think this plot or this command here will help us to see what happens. So I think I'm also, ah, okay. So we have the numbers from one to 10 here, and we have the shifted ones from one to five here and from six to 10 here. So note that if this corresponds to, um, the Fourier coefficient um, f1, so maybe I, I just write it in here. I have here the coefficient that corresponds to f0. I have here f1, and uh, here I have f minus 1. Yeah, so the low frequency part is situated here. So I need to find out the position of F0 first, which is six. In general, if I have a signal F of length N, then this middle frequency F0 will be located at N halves plus one. Yeah? It also works in this case. So in this case, N equals 10, N by two is five, plus one gives me six. So this is the, the frequency that corresponds to, um, oh, sorry. This was very, really confusing. This is of course uh, F1, this is F2, and this is F0 here. Yeah, so the first element of my Fourier coefficients is F1, and it corresponds to omega zero, the constant signal. Then to the left and to the right, I have the positive and negative frequency that is the smallest one if I cancel out the, the constant one. So I have the constant one and then the second smallest frequency here. Okay, so if I want to have the M lowest frequencies, I need to go M steps to the right. And I also need to go M steps to the left. And then I get an index set, which is a subset of the indices of one to n, where I have 
these this precise information in the the Fourier transform. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's all that we uh, that we need to know in order to now really work with a simple low pass filter. So normally this would be a homework question, but in order to save you some work, we are going to discuss this one dimensional simple low pass filter here. So maybe let us first look at, um, at this filter and see if we can spot all the ingredients that we discussed in the last half hour in the program that I wrote. Hope you can all read it. So uh, ah, maybe not show you too much so you do, do not get confused. So we have a simple low pass filter that takes a signal F and it, I wanted to eliminate the D smallest frequencies, including um, the frequency uh, zero. Or I think it's, uh, it's the other way around. So it's a low pass filter. So I want to maintain the M lowest frequencies and get rid of the rest. So what do we do? Let us go through it line by line. So I have a signal of length n, and I also assume that um, my signal length is even. Yeah. Um, if you if you work with uneven signals, normally for the FFT, MATLAB will pad your image with zero or will pad your um, signal with zeros such that you have always a signal of even length. You saw here for a lot of computations, it is just easier if I can divide the number n by two. And this is what this program assumes. It's, it's, in the end, it's a simple program. So I do not want to do some sophisticated padding here. So then what I do here is I take the FFT of my signal and then I take, I shift the signal. So shifting means what we just did here. So this is FFT shift. Take my signal and then I rearrange the coefficients so that the low frequency components are located precisely in the middle and the high frequency components are uh, at the outside. And now comes the formula that we just discussed. So I take a, a I now write a new um, set of coefficients that I initialize with zeros. And I copy this, the um, coefficients that I want to maintain. Uh, so this should be just, uh, so if we take a look at the, at the left end, it should be n over two plus one minus d. So the left end of the coefficients that I want to maintain to the right end of the coefficients that I want to maintain. I just copy the values from the original Fourier transform. And as I initialized F0 with zeros, this means I'm just going to cancel out the rest. Okay, and then I transform back. So I, uh, and now I need to, of course, also shift back. Yeah, so I, sh First, I shift in order to cancel out frequencies, and then I need to shift the signal back because the Fourier transform or inverse Fourier transform um, does not know that I shifted or not. So I need to shift back. You can either use, uh, yeah. So I think it's obvious from the shifting operation that shifting twice gives you the original result. Uh, if you don't believe me, so this is FFT shift from the numbers from one to 10. If I do a FFT shift again, uh, I'm here. So they also implemented an uh, inverse operation for this, but you can just use this one twice. I also take a real. Is there a missing a plus one at? Uh, so thanks for the for the question. So where should uh, something be missing here on the notes? 
Ah, so sorry, I cannot see uh, your annotation. It's uh, ah, it's a uh, ah. Let me see if I can find your annotation because I'm I'm sharing something to you that I'm not working on. Okay. Ah, no, I can I cannot see your annotation. Sorry. But actually, I do not know where the A should be on the notes. So I take, so this one is the middle. And get, I go M steps to the right. Ah, yeah, yeah. So you're completely right. I, I also did it here. So, um, Because if m equals 1, I'm just staying where I just were. So thanks for the correction. So I need to go, right? If m equals 1, I'm just here. So this here is my m equals to 1. So uh, I need to add m on the number that is here. Yeah, completely right. Thank you for the comment. And if you if you look closely, it's also what I did here. So I. I go these steps to the right. So sorry for the um, different notation, but what is small m here on the right hand side is a small d on the left. I shift back with the inverse Fourier transform. And because sometimes due to rounding errors, it can happen that the signal that I get back, even though it should be real valued, is complex valued, I also do a transformation to the real numbers here. Now let's look at an example. Um, ah, so maybe let us run this example. So what I have here is the Fourier transform of a signal. And we see it has, so the absolute value of the Fourier transform gives me four dots up here. What you see here in this picture is already the centered information of the Fourier transform. That means the low frequencies are here in the middle and the high frequencies are on the outside. So if I now know, so I need to count where, where these, <clears throat> how many steps from the middle of the signal are those low frequencies maintained, uh, located, sorry. Where are those frequencies located? And if you, if you look closely, it's just one to the right and one to the left. Now, if you look at the data, it's, uh, it's a little bit easier to spot than in the plot. So if I now just want to maintain this, this low frequency information, this means I need to cancel out those high frequencies. And I can do this with the low pass filter that we just, um, yeah, that we just visited. And uh, the script I just ran does the same. So let me give you the result. So we have a we have a high frequency signal that is that sits on top of a low frequency signal. Maybe if we look at the at the signal itself, we can also see it here. So we have a sine with uh, angular frequency two pi and a cosine with angular frequency sixteen pi. So the cosine is the one that oscillates fast here, and this is the one where also these two dots in the Fourier transform correspond to. And we cancel it out by just zeroing this coefficients and we get back this red curve here. And that's how we use a, can that's how we can use a, a low pass filter. Ah, so maybe if you didn't see this, uh, here again is are the signals that are that we see. So the one is the, the sign, and this is the one that also maintains or that, that is uh, maintained in the end. All right, that's it for me today. Mm -hmm.